I stand here, you see me. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming back. Uh, before we start this uh, interesting afternoon session, uh, we have two greetings on behalf of the international uh, participation and support of our WIMSA uh, mission and activity. So uh, the first person that will deliver the greetings is Gar Gabriela Araju Pardo. She is the president of the Mexican Mathematical Society. Oh, eh, dear community, Winsa, advancing women in mathematics across the Americas. Maybe you could be closer to the mic. Here? <laughs> closer? Yeah. Here? Well, it is a great pleasure for me to have been invited to this event as the representative of the Mexican Mathematical Society. I would like to say a few words about what we are doing in Mexico and the society. First, I want to thank uh, Dr. Mina Telker for her invitation. I am glad Ernesto Lupercio insisted to me that I find a spice, a space in my, in my schedule this week to be able to attend, which uh, was not easy because we are now at the final countdown for the Mexican Congress of Mathematics, which will take place next week in the Georgius city of Guadalajara in Jalisco, Mexico. We feel tried to have at last achieved a hybrid conference with a presence-based modality at its centerpiece component. I would like to share that at Mexican Mathematical Society, we are extremely aware that our paramount goal must be to promote research of the highest level. It is also important that we stay involved in all different aspects, aspects of outreach, education, and the popularization of mathematics at all academic levels, while linking it to works of society, both public and private. But the main issue we are currently working on at the present committee board is the inclusion and promotion of, historic, of historically underrepresented groups in the Mexican community of mathematics, especially women. We are working extremely hard on these issues. We'll guaranteeing safe spaces for all community members, will improving the harmonic, harmonic coexistence between all of these groups. I have been personally involved in this process for about 10 years since I first collaborated on the creation of the Gender and Equality Commission at the Mexican Mathematical Society. As its president, I now have an, an extraordinary opportunity to guide our efforts in that direction. Once again, I want to thank for you, uh, you for inviting me, and I sincerely hope this conference closes with this beautiful and unforgettable atmosphere. Thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me. And now we are we are going to hear some greeting from Professor Milushka Velishka Milusheva. She is the deputy director of the Institute of Mathematics and Informatics of the Bulgarian Academy of Science in Sofia, Bulgaria. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, it's a great pleasure for me and a great honor to be here to attend this nice uh, WIMSA conference, inaugural conference, Math is for the Future, uh, which is the most important mathematical event of this uh, nice initiative, the multi-year program on advancing women in mathematics across the Americas. I was thrilled to receive this kind invitation from Stephen Cantrell, thank you, Stephen, and from Mina Teicher, uh, who is uh, the st starting this program, which is a wonderful initiative to promote women in mathematics and also to promote various activities related to women 
in the field of mathematics, application of mathematics, and especially to support the research and the career development of young women and girls. Uh, actually, this idea corresponds to the main objective of the Committee for Women in Mathematics at the International Mathematical Union, as it is written on the website of the Committee for Women in Mathematics. Their main objective is to propose, encourage and facilitate activities which would tend to increase the visibility of women in mathematics and lead to an increase in their representation in the mathematical community at all levels and in all parts of the world. As a deputy director of the Institute of Mathematics and uh, Informatics and the newly established International Center for Mathematical Sciences in Sofia, I'm currently involved in the organization of uh, similar activities in our center in Sofia, which are carried out in collaboration with our partner, the uh, Institute of Mathematical Sciences of the Americas in Miami. And inspired by the ideas and the great enthusiasm of MINA, uh, in December 2020, we started uh, an initiative, Women in Mathematics in Southeastern Europe, with the mission to promote the role of female mathematicians, to disseminate new results in mathematics and its applications, and to create new long-term collaborations among scientists on the Balkans. The first two conferences were in 2020 and 2021. They were held online because of the complicated COVID situation everywhere. But this year we are organizing uh, the event on site, and we really hope that we will manage to do it in person. We believe women in mathematics in Southeastern Europe will attract the attention of young female researchers and researchers also from less favored countries. And with this series of annual conferences, we also try to expand the international contacts between uh, national and regional women's organizations on the Balkans. I would like to invite all of you to participate in this conference in December 8 and 9 in Sofia. And of course, the conference is open to anyone involved in mathematics, not only women. Uh, I see my participation in this WIMSA inaugural conference as a good opportunity for expanding the scientific collaboration between the Institute of Mathematics and Informatics in Bulgaria and foreign research institutions as well as establishing personal contacts with mathematicians who could be involved in the activities of our center. Once again, I would like to express my great gratitude to Stephen Cantrell and to Mina Teicher, who visited Sofia two times and uh, supported our efforts in finding financial support from the Ministry of Education and Science in Bulgaria. And I'm convinced that we will continue to enlarge the joint activities between the two institutions, IMSA Miami and ICMS Sofia. Uh, also, I would like to mention that uh, since 2020, our institute became part of the Institute of the Mathematical Sciences of the Americas Consortium, whose purpose is a collaboration between institutions in higher education and establishment of joint research activities. Many members of this consortium have been participating in the events organized in our center in Sofia, like Ernesto Lupercio, like Philip Griffiths, Maxim Kuncevich, Jorgen Andenser, Oscar Garcia Prada, and others. On behalf of my colleagues from the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences and the management of our Institute of Mathematics and Informatics, I express our best wishes for success of this multi-year program advancing women in mathematics across the Americas. I'm convinced you will continue to encourage women and girls to develop research careers in mathematics and its applications and to promote equal opportunities and equal treatment of women in the mathematical sciences. I'm sure women can make mathematics more beautiful and the world a better place to live in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for these uh, greetings and uh, mission.
etc. Uh, we had uh, um, the last two days, we had the presentation of support from other uh, countries. We had uh, a, a speech by the director of the Center of Advanced Study in Warsaw, who's also a member of this consortium that Velishka talked about. Uh, we had a presentation from, uh, from uh, Israel. We had also a presentation from the United States of America. Of course, we had uh, Mexico, but this was uh, mentioned here. And uh, we will have this afternoon later the public speech by a uh, representative from South Africa, but that we'll talk, we'll talk later. Uh, and I'm starting now, almost on time, the, the two uh, scientific uh, lectures. Uh, the first one is by Professor June Barrow Green. She is from the Open University in the UK. So we have also uh, the UK represented here, but she's talking now with another hat. She's talking because she's the chair of the International Commission for History of Mathematics, which I believe you'll, you'll uh, correct me, that is, um, is a subcommittee of International Mathematical Union. So uh, I believe this is the case. And uh, she will give us, she will give us some light and uh, understanding of uh, women in mathematics in the past. And I'm reading, I hope I will read it well. Uh, a sex so little made to brave the thorns of science. Very Shakespeare. Uh, um, a title, The Historical Representation of Women in Mathematics. Please. Okay, thank you very much, Mina. Um, and I, I'm very grateful to you for this opportunity to speak. I'm only sorry that I'm having to do it from uh, several thousand miles away and I, I can't be actually with you. Um, so, uh, yes, as, as Mina says, I'm going to be talking about the historical representation of women in maths. Now, the motivation for this talk comes from the work I've been doing on the um, uh, history of the gender gap in maths. Uh, and it's, uh, as we all know only too well, that not enough women are attracted uh, to mathematics. And although there's work of many different constituencies, I think have really helped to improve the situation, um, there still remains a lot to do. And the fact that there aren't, um, uh, that women are not going into or staying in maths at the same rate as men, means that a lot of mathematical talent um, is going missing. So, um, I think, as I say, while strenuous efforts are being made to, to really counter this, I think um, uh, historical research shows us how really deep rooted um, the negative view of women in mathematics is. Um, and also how some of these negative images are still in evidence today. And I think by looking at some of these images um, and the context in which they were created, I think it provides us with a different way to open up the discussion about women in mathematics. So I'm going to show you um, various images of women mathematicians, um, as well as uh, uh, descriptions, real and fictional. Um, there'll be examples um, of how women mathematicians were viewed by, uh, by others, but also examples of how women mathematicians viewed themselves. So I wanted to start with some numbers. So forgive me that this, um, uh, the numbers are in the UK context. Um, so this comes from an article that was published in something called the Times uh, Higher Education Sub Supplement in the spring this year. So just to give you an idea of what the situation is like in the UK. So roughly 40% of the students who do A-levels, that's the, um, the mathematics they do before going to university, are, are women. Not much of a drop off um, to undergraduates quite a drop off when you get to PhD students and a very big drop off when you get um, up to professors. Now, of course, that's not quite so surprising because it takes time for, for the uh, advantages or the, the, the progress that we've made to, to filter through. But I think it's, it's, it's quite worrying for us in the UK that these numbers have stayed quite stagnant for the last uh, few years. Um, so there is still a lot of work to be done in this in this area. Um, so 
Um, so let's start by looking at some images. Now, my story is going to be a, a chronological one. Um, and although I'm going to be giving you some biographical details, they'll generally be quite sparse because I want to concentrate uh, on the images. So um, here we have um, some images that purport to be of Hippatia, um, who was uh, one of the first women philosopher mathematicians in ancient Greece. And she was the daughter of a, of a mathematician, Theon of Alexandria. And um, it's um, generally understood that she assisted her father with his addition of Euclid's elements and his commentary on Ptolemy's Almagest. And uh, she wrote commentaries herself on um, the Chronics of Apollonius and um, the Arithmetica of Diophantus. However, um, she's probably best known um, for her brutal death uh, at the hands of a mob of Christian monks. And this has led her to become an icon uh, for various reasons. Now, I'm not going to kind of go into that, but I can recommend a lecture which is freely available online if you want to know more about her. But so these are, as I say, these are four images um, that uh, purport to be a Hippatia. I just went onto a Google and I, I got the first sort of four images I could find. But of course, clearly, they're not of the same person. So the question is, which, if any of them, is a true image of Hippatia? Well, I don't think you'll be surprised to learn that actually none of them are. Uh, one of them comes, the fresco from Pompeii, as well before Hippatia um, lived. Um, the second one is from Raphael's cartoon of um, the, his famous school of, of Athens. Um, and in, indeed, this, this particular figure has been, uh, it's been told that uh, this is supposed to re his representation of Hippatia, but actually Raphael himself never um, gave this particular figure um, her name. Then uh, the next one along um, is by the French born American artist um, Gaspar. Um, and it's an illustration for um, a fictional biography of Hippatia. And then the very extravagant, uh, I would suggest, uh, portrait on the far right is uh, by uh, Mitchell and was created as an illustration for Charles Kingsley's novel on Hippatia. Um, some of you may know Kingsley better for his uh, children's fairy tale, The Water Babies. So um, given that none of these uh, images are of Hippatia, and of course, if we think about it for a minute, in any event, why would we expect there to be an image of Hippatia still in existence, given that she lived so long ago? Um, but the reason I'm showing them um, is really, first of all, to state, I think, to state the obvious, we should be very clear about the origins um, uh, of the images we show and why we want to show them. I think people very sort of hastily, they put up a picture and they think that that, um, because they find it on Google and they don't bother to kind of investigate it further. Uh, and I think it's very important that we actually know what the images are that we're displaying and why we're displaying. What is the, what is the point? Um, and also I think it's, it's interesting to see how people who are not mathematicians portray women mathematicians. Um, and particularly, of course, um, that example by uh, Mitchell. Um, so I will see further examples. But now to move on um, rather uh, rapidly through time to the uh, medieval and Renaissance period. And here we don't really find um, images of women mathematicians but rather women as muses for mathematics. Um, and in particular for the mathematical arts of the quadrivium, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. And this is a medieval image here. Um, and you can see that um, you might just be able to see that the names of the mathematicians that are being portrayed here, we can see Pythagoras um, and uh, Euclid and so on. And when I came across this image um, on the web, I wanted to know where it came from. And I couldn't find it. It was this particular image was all over the place, but there was no, I had no idea, was it genuine even? Um, and um, in fact, I did discover where it came from purely through a chance conversation on a train. I was on a train going to Oxford, started chatting to the uh, woman next to me who turned out to be a medievalist. And I, uh, and I asked her, and in fact, she didn't know, but she said she was sure she knew someone who, who would, and indeed she did. And so I, my problem was solved for me. And it comes, in fact, from this um, 
a text from 1340 of the seven liberal arts. So you can see someone has actually kind of taken out the, the images of the, the, the quadrivium and, and put them together. Um, but, uh, but I think it, it's quite a lesson in a sense that this image is, as I say, appears a lot on the, but nobody is bothered to, to say where it actually uh, comes from. Um, so let me just go on. So now I want to move on even more um, quickly um, and look at um, a, a woman mathematician from the 18th century, uh, Maria Agnesi. Now, um, Maria Agnesi was, um, uh, she was, she lived in Milan. She wrote uh, the first, well, one of the first textbooks on the calculus, the Institutes Uni Analyticae, which she wrote for her, uh, her younger brothers. And uh, this book was very well received and um, uh, it was written in the vernacular. So, which meant it was very accessible. And as a result of the book, she was um, uh, appointed to the chair of mathematics in Bologna by the Pope. But in fact, she never ever went there, um, although her name was sort of on the rolls of the university. So she's sometimes referred to as the first uh, female professor of mathematics, but um, she, she never actually practiced as such. And, um, but the book did very well. It was translated into French and it was translated into English. Um, but after she wrote this book, she, she basically, she devoted her life uh, to charity. She didn't uh, continue with her work on mathematics. But the real reason I want to, to bring her um, into this talk is because of this particular quote, which is where my title comes from. It's not, I'm afraid, Mina, it's not from Shakespeare. <laughs> um, it's from Montucla, um, French historian of mathematics. And in his uh, book, um, he writes about Agnesi and he says, I must cite here with praise the Institutiones Analytique of Mademoiselle Maria Gatana Agnesi, a work that a French lady mathematician, for we have them here too, should have translated into our language. It is not without astonishment that we see a person of a sex so little made to brave the thorns of science, able to penetrate so deeply into all parts of analysis, either ordinary or transcendental. Now, at first sight, you might think, well, gosh, this is this is very good. He's he's praise, he's praising her. Um, this is what we want to see. But if we read it a little more carefully, we see the fact he says is not without astonishment that we see a person of a sex so little made to brave the thorns of science. I, as a woman, she's not made to do mathematics. So in some sense, this, she's a um, she's an aberration. The, the fact that she is doing mathematics because she was, she's not made to do it because she's a woman. Um, also note the fact that he mentions that um, it should have, uh, that a French lady mathematician should have translated it. So why is he saying that? Is he saying it because he thinks women do mathematics in a, in a different way to men? So actually, you, if, if a woman is doing mathematics, only a woman can really translate it. Um, so I think we, we need to be uh, careful when we when we read things, as I say, initially, um, the first thought might be that this is a very um, uh, praise, she's really, he's really praising her, but uh, which indeed he is, but that but there is these other sort of messages um, hidden in in here. Um, and so in fact, the woman that he was referring to, of course, was Emily du Chatelet. And I have to uh, admit that this is just one of my very famous favorite images of all of women in mathematics um, because she is declaring to the world she is a mathematician. Um, we see her, she's wearing her, her finery, but she has an astrolabe in the background. She has she's holding her compasses or, or dividers. She has her geometry text in front of her and she would have chosen to have been portrayed this way. Um, we can see that, I mean, she comes from a sort of minor aristocracy um, but she studied mathematics um, and she studied with Maupertuis and Clairaut. Um, she's famous for her translation of Newton's Principia. I'll say a bit about that in a minute. And in particular, also with her relationship with Voltaire, which was both personal and scientific. Um, so um, it's important, I think, to notice with her, the social class from which she comes. She is in an environment in um, 18th century France where she can engage in scientific discourse with uh, male mathematicians, but she can't 
she can't enter the spaces in which they communicate really with one another. So, for example, she can't be um, a member of the academy. Um, and there were very few uh, positions anyway. But I mean, there was no question uh, of her having any sort of scientific position um, that was uh, that wouldn't have even been contemplated. But the fact that she could she couldn't um, go and give a, a paper at the academy or whatever, but she could um, engage in scientific discourse in the sort of salons and things. And this was perfectly acceptable um, for a woman of her um, of her class. And um, what we see here with further images of her. This is from um, Voltaire's um, uh, interpretation of Newton's uh, Principia. Um, and in it, we see the front, the main frontispiece, which is the image on the right. Uh, we see Newton up in the clouds. We see Du Chatelet on the, uh, on the right with the mirror. And she's acting as a conduit for Newton's ideas down to Voltaire, who's scribbling at the desk below. Now, Voltaire is uh, quite explicit about the fact that um, she has helped him with the book. Um, you can see from these other pages that I've put um, on the bottom of the slide. Um, but the book is very definitely by him. She is not, um, uh, it's not a dual publication. And of course, that wasn't something that really happened at that time anyway. But um, it just, would, again, it would not have been something that would have even kind of crossed their minds. Um, but the reality of it is that Voltaire could not have written this book without uh, Du Chatelet. She was by far the better mathematician than him. She was an extremely good mathematician. Um, and, um, and, and we know this because of her um, translation of the Principia. The Principia is a fiercely difficult book and arguably one of the most important books, uh, scientific books ever written. But um, Newton had had written it in uh, essentially in uh, geometrical language um, and it made it very difficult for people uh, to understand. And the fact that Du Chatelet was not only able to translate it but produce an extensive commentary which showed that she really understood it shows what a good mathematician she was. Um, and here we have another portrait of her, um, again showing herself as a mathematician with an astrolabe and holding her compasses and, and dividers. Um, but if we look, there's another image of her which tells a slightly different story. So this comes from the, a book by the Italian Francesco Alderotti, and he'd visited um, Du Chatelet in France, and he publishes his book, which is um, Newtonianism for Ladies, um, and it's, it's in the form of, of a dialogue uh, between a, a French chevalier explaining some of Newton's experiments to a marchioness. And here we have the frontispiece with the chevalier explaining to uh, the marchioness. And it, it's well um, uh, recognized that this is, in fact, meant to be a portrait of Du Chatelet. Uh, and nothing could be further from the truth. She, again, was a much better mathematician than Algarotti. She would have been explaining um, the, the mathematics to him. And yet he has. Uh, portrayed it in uh, completely the other way around. Now I'm showing this uh, uh, image because this is by Latour, by the by the person who who painted the the first picture of Du Chatelet. Um, she is somebody that I rather doubt any any of you will have heard of. Um, I hadn't until I came across the portrait. Uh, she was basically a philosopher. Um, who was interested in mathematics and she had visitors to her salon in Paris. Um, uh, she had mathematicians, including Clairaut, Maupertuis, d'Alembert and Jean Benoui. Um, but what's interesting about this portrait is that she, again, like Emily uh, du Chatelet, has chosen to show herself to the world as somebody who's interested in mathematics and science, because behind her is her copy of Voltaire's um, edition of Newton. It's actually bigger than the book would have been in, in, in reality. But to me, it's very interesting that a woman of her position um, would have chosen to have her portrait painted in this way. And we'll see uh, quite a different situation when we come to Britain in the, in the next century. Um, I want to now move on to Sophie Germain, who I suspect uh, many of you uh, will know about. Um, she's uh, basically an autodidact. She learned her mathematics from books in her father's library. She wanted to uh, learn more mathematics. 
and uh, she was in Paris and the place to learn mathematics was the Ecole Polytechnique, but of course women were not accepted. So she writes to um, one of the uh, lecturers there, Lagrange, under the, a male pseudonym. And she has a correspondence with Lagrange. And eventually they end up meeting. And of course, he's rather surprised to discover she's a woman, but um, nonetheless um, is not put off by that, uh, which uh, is very much uh, to his credit. She, she has uh, a really um, quite a sort of stellar career for a woman mathematician of the, of the period, although of course she doesn't have a, a position, um, but she wins, uh, she's the first woman to win a French Academy Prize, this is for work on elasticity, and she does important work um, on uh, Fermat's last theorem, um, much of which has only really come to light quite recently. Um, and the only images of her we have are images that were made after she died. And there's sort of mysteries around the one on the, on the left. I've been trying to find out where that um, originates from. Um, I know it comes from a, a book, um, the image that appears in a book um, that was published in the 1880s, but where the author got the image from or whether it's made up um, or whether it comes from an original drawing, I don't know. So if anybody has any idea, I would be very happy um, to hear from them. But um, the real reason, well, not the real reason, but uh, an important reason I've chosen her as someone to, to focus on is because of this quote from Gauss. So she writes to Gauss, and again, she uses her male pseudonym. And what Gauss, uh, and Gauss responds, and he says, how can I describe my astonishment and admiration on seeing my esteemed correspondent, Monsieur Leblanc, metamorphosed into this celebrated person, yielding a paper so brilliant, it's hard to believe. The taste for the abstract sciences in general, and above all for the mystery of numbers, is very rare. So this was a uh, work on number theory. Um, this is not surprising, since the charms of this sublime science in all their beauty reveal themselves only to those who have the courage to fathom them. And then this is the key passage. But when a woman, because of her sex, our customs and prejudices, encounters infinitely more obstacles than men, in familiarizing herself with their knotty problems, yet overcomes these fetters and penetrates that which is most hidden. She doubtless has the most noble courage, extraordinary talent and superior genius. Now notice how very different this is to Montucla, because what he's saying is that what she's done is fantastic. And of course, he's amazed that um, this, someone who he thought was a man turned out to be a woman. But he's saying that actually it's incredible what she's, she's managed to achieve because of the barriers that have been put up for her uh, by men. Um, um, and so he, he is recognizing her talent and he is not, as Montucla was saying, well, you know, she wasn't made to do this. He's saying, actually, she is extraordinary because she's done this fantastic piece of mathematics um, and she's had all these barriers to overcome as well. So I now want to move on to Britain and to Mary Somerville. Uh, I have uh, a fantastic PhD student, Bridget Stenhouse, who has um, just uh, last year uh, wrote her PhD on the mathematics of Mary Somerville. You'll often hear Mary Somerville described as a mathematician, but um, until Bridget started uh, really looking at her, no one had actually uh, really looked at her mathematics but she's an important figure in, in Britain. Uh, Somerville College in Oxford is named for her. Some of you may have heard of that. Um, and she's really best known for her books on popular science. Um, but she had, she had a paper published by the Royal Society. She was the first woman um, to do so. Her Mechanism of the Heavens, which was her first book, was her interpretation of Laplace's Mechanique Celeste, so which was a um, five volume work, the sort of successor to Newton's Principia, if you like. Um, and again, fiercely difficult. And uh, she showed that she really understood the mathematics in it. Um, and she was recognized for, for that, but she became really known for the works of popular science that she wrote afterwards. And uh, this is a picture of her bust in the Royal Society uh, in London. She's the only woman to have a bust there. Now, of course, she couldn't go into the Royal Society as a woman. The first women were only admitted to the Royal Society in the 1940s. And the first woman mathematician um, was in the sort of third uh, intake of women in the, in the late 1940s, which was Mary Cartwright. Um, but what I want to uh, show you with her are various things. One, this is um, a comment 
from William Hewell um, on Mary Somerville. Um, Hewell was a polymath, one of the sort of leading figures in Cambridge in the middle of the 19th century. Um, he was uh, he made contributions to philosophy, physics, geology, astronomy, uh, economics, and he became master of Trinity College. So he was a really a, a, a big figure um, in, in Cambridge at the time. And he writes a review of um, one of uh, Mary Somerville's popular books. And he says of her, he says, one of the brightest ornaments of England and the only woman in our own time to have had possession of the most profound and abstruse provinces of human knowledge, mathematics. And then he goes on to say, so the instances of eminent female mathematicians who've appeared in the history of the world are very rare. There are only two others who occur to us as worthy of entirely honorable notice, Hippatia and Agnesi. And both of these were extraordinary persons. Madame de Châtelet, whole character and conduct have not attracted to her the interest which belongs to the other two. So de Châtelet is cast aside because of her relationship with Voltaire. Um, and I have yet to find an instance of uh, a male mathematician who is cast aside in, um, in the same way. Um, and, uh, and it's arguable that uh, certainly uh, du Châtelet as a mathematician was equ uh, certainly equal to Agnesi and, and uh, I would suggest arguably better. Um, and then if we look at images of Mary Somerville, so this is a portrait of her that was painted, um, it was commissioned by her publisher painted by one of the leading uh, portrait artists in, um, in London of the time, Thomas Phillips. And you notice in, in complete contrast to the to Châtelet portrait, you would have no idea that Mary Somerville was a mathematician. There is nothing about this portrait that gives you any indication whatsoever. So, um, and you might say, well, perhaps this was just not the, the style in, in Britain at the time. And that's, yeah, there's, there's um, I think there's some weight in that. There is a, um, an image of uh, Margaret Bryan, um, who, this is a frontispiece to a, a, a sort of school textbook that she wrote on, um, on astronomy. And we can see her, again, an astrolabe and a telescope um, there. And so she's uh, not at all shying away from having uh, scientific instruments in her portrait. But of course, this is in the frontispiece to a book that she wants to sell. So she's showing with her daughters that this book is something that is accessible uh, for young girls. Um, so it's a very different context to the Mary Somerville um, portrait. So I thought, well, actually, maybe the artist himself preferred to paint um, his portraits without kind of accoutrements. But again, this turns out not to be the case either, because uh, Humphrey Davy, we see here with his Davy lamp, and we see Michael Faraday with his Crookshank battery, both uh, uh, other portraits by Thomas Phillips. So um, we need to think, well, why would Mary Somerville not uh, choose to be painted with some indication of what she uh, could do, particularly as this portrait was commissioned by her publisher of the book on the mechanisms of the heavens and her other books. Um, one cannot imagine that he would not have wanted her to have um, had any um, uh, indication of her of her talent. Um, but where we do find, I think, a bit of an answer to this question is um, in uh, an unpublished manuscript um, by her. So this was a draft um, of her personal recollections, and which gets published by her and uh, uh, sort of jointly with her daughter. But this is part of the manuscript that doesn't get published, and um, and we can see here. I think it's a sort of early, almost like an early example of imposter syndrome. She's she's saying um, that she she was very she she was very gratified by um, the sort of the approbation that she got from um, some of the best scientific men of the age, people like uh, John Herschel and, and Babbage and so on. But she was less elated than she expected. And she was conscious, she says, that I had made no discovery myself. I had no original originality. I had perseverance and intelligence, but no genius. So she just didn't rate herself because she felt she had not made any mathematical discoveries herself. And of course, you know, she's, I think she's being extremely hard on herself here because she showed that she had mathematical talent. But of course, the opportunities were very limited. She, again, she couldn't be uh, a fellow of the Royal Society. She couldn't have a position in a university. She, her only opportunity 
to uh, do mathematics was um, in sort of uh, in a social space. Um, and again, my uh, Bridget has written very nicely um, about how her, in fact, Mary Somerville's husband uh, really helped facilitate her um, her scientific endeavours. Um, um, and I want to just show a final thing about her is this is um, a self portrait which was given to Somerville College and the, um, the sort of leading expert on Victorian portraits um, in the 1970s was a keeper, one of the keepers of the uh, National Portrait Gallery. And he said about it, he says, this is a painting by an unknown artist and it was presented by a member of, of um, Mary Somerville's family. And he says, the donor described it as a self portrait but it appears too fluent and sophisticated to be the work of an amateur. So he's, he's dismissing the fact that it could be by her because he just thinks what well, scientists she could only be a, uh, an amateur artist. But what he didn't know, um, or he didn't bother to find out, was that actually she had attended classes of Alexander Naismith, uh, a distinguished uh, landscape artist. These are also uh, pictures by her that are in Somerville College. Um, and she clearly had a talent and she was known to have a talent um, by people um, uh, when, when she was alive. Um, and I think this, this kind of betrays really a, an attitude towards the idea of thinking about, well, if a woman is going to be a scientist, they couldn't possibly be an artist as well. Um, and, um, and I think it shows a very kind of narrow view of um, what one might think of a, a woman mathematician um, and something that we really need to, uh, to counter. Uh, and um, uh, to move on to Ada Lovelace, Ada Lovelace was mentored by um, uh, Mary Somerville, uh, well known, of course, because of the commentary she wrote on um, uh, Manabria's article on Babbage's analytical engine. And um, what I want to say about her is to show how views of her uh, have changed over time. So if we look at um, what was said when she died, um, uh, very complimentary. She was thoroughly original, um, genius. She, she possessed um, mathematical, um, so on. And then then um, some 20 years later, um, again, still very uh, complimentary. Um, her notes display a surprising knowledge of analysis. And Manabria well says they display no ordinary sagacity. So again, she doesn't just um, translate Manabria's article. She is an extensive commentary where she shows that she really has um, ideas of what the potential for, for, com for computers might be. But then what happens um, we go forward 100 years and we get a completely different picture. So this is um, somebody writing in the 1970s. Um, it would be a slight exaggeration to say that Babbage wrote the notes to Manabria's paper. Um, and for reasons of his own, encouraged the illusion in the minds of Ada and the public, they were authored by her. It's no exaggeration to say she was a manic depressive with the most amazing delusions about her own talents and a rather shallow understanding of Babbage and the analytical engine mad as a hatter, contributed little more to the notes than trouble. I'll retain an open mind on whether she was crazy because of substance abuse or despite it. I hope nobody feels compelled to write another book on the subject, but then I guess someone has to be the most overrated figure in the history of computing. Well, how can this be the same person as the person we've just uh, seen these other comments on? Well, if we come forward um, to much more recently, we can understand what's been going on here. It's because people who've been writing about Lovelace, um, particularly latterly, um, they've jumped on her because of course, as Byron's daughter, um, she's very attractive um, as a subject. And people who have written about her have not studied her mathematical notes and her, uh, the actual mathematics that she did. And Hollings, Martin and Rice um, have spent a long time looking at her papers in the Bodleian and particularly her correspondence with Augustus de Morgan, who was the professor of, of mathematics at uh, University College London and who was engaged by her mother um, to teach her mathematics. And we can see her developing as a mathematician. We can see what mathematics that she, she did uh, in fact know. And, um, um, and, uh, and they make, I think, a very sound judgment on her, um, uh, on her ability. And one of the things, the other points they make, as, as well as uh, what's on the quote here, um, is that she died young. So that 
actually there was potential there that was probably never um, realized. Um, but I think, I mean, it is very, very striking the, um, the different um, uh, ways in which she has been described. And, um, and I think what it does underline um, for me, and obviously I'm not exactly a, an unbiased observer here, but the importance of having historians of mathematics looking at the archives of mathematicians um, so that they actually recognize what is what the mathematics is and, and the level of mathematics that's being being done. Um, so I now for the last part want to move to um, uh, basic, basically to Cambridge, um, to England, Victorian England, the end of the 19th, uh, the last quarter of the 19th century. And um, to start with just um, a quote, which points out one of the uh, rather uh, ter well awful <laughs> views that was around at the time about women who did mathematics and science. It really was believed by a number of men, uh, perhaps conveniently so, that if women engaged in mathematics and science at this time, that they it would have a really serious physical um, it would sort of drain them of physical strength and it would have a, a sort of a, a bad effect on them so much so that it could even affect their ability um, to bear children um, so so women were cautioned against doing things like mathematics and science and this is somebody who was a former uh, lord vice chancellor um, on the opening of a girls school um, and saying what well, actually medical men say there's not women don't have enough physical power and strength um, to engage in higher mathematics. Um, so, and then if we look, if we go to Cambridge, now Cambridge at this time, Girton and Newnham have, were founded in the 1870s. They're not part of the university. Women cannot get degrees at Cambridge until 1948. Um, it's a really shocking um, uh, piece of information. Um, and, but women could study, they studied at, at Girton and Newnham, they could sit the mathematical tripos, but uh, up until 1880, they had to get permission. Um, some of the men lecturers were supportive of the women and would go to the women's colleges um, to, to help teach them their mathematics. After 1880, with the work with the uh, triumph of Charlotte Scott, who came uh, the equivalent of the eighth Wrangler, um, she was given permission to sit the tripos and she became equivalent to the student who came eighth in the order of merit. Now, the order of merit was a really big deal in Cambridge at the time. The person who came top in the maths tripos was um, celebrated all over the place. It was uh, notices were put in the national newspapers and the local newspapers. The local home time would have um, fireworks and bonfires and all kinds of things. It was a really, really seriously big deal. Very, very hard examination. Um, largely because it was a, a race against time and the problems were kind of construed to be as, um, as sort of fiendish as possible. Um, and um, so for women to do well in the exam was uh, remarkable. Uh, and here also we see a, a sort of quote um, from Grant Allen, who wrote and he said, well, out of every hundred women, roughly speaking, 96 have husbands provided for them by nature only four need go into a nunnery or take to teaching the higher mathematics. And what we see here saying, well, if women are going to be doing mathematics, there's no chance for them to get married um, or have a family or anything like that. It's mathematics is a masculine subject. It's for men. Um, and if women choose to do it, well, then they're actually, they're kind of disqualifying themselves from anything that is considered to be kind of feminine um, at this period. And then we see this cartoon from Punch, Punch, girl graduate, single figure, a kind of pun on, on the single figure. Um, and here we have um, Charlotte Scott, who I've just mentioned. And um, she had to make her career at uh, Bryn Mawr in, in the States. There was no chance for her to have a job as a professor of mathematics in, in Britain. Um, and um, she was the first, she was the founding uh, uh, professor of mathematics at, uh, at Bryn Mawr. But uh, what I want to show you here is uh, one of the comments about her. So when she became equivalent uh, to the eighth Wrangler, this was huge news. Again, it was all over the place. It was in, you can find, um, uh, articles about it in all kinds of different journals and uh, magazines and so on. And I've just picked one here. 
um, because again, it's emphasizing the fact that mathematics is a masculine subject. Um, the fact that um, she has done so well, they say that um, the world should remember there have always been women of the masculine type. Um, and, um, and we see these kinds of uh, remarks um, uh, with other uh, women of the time. Um, even more remarkable thing happened in um, 1890, Philippa Fawcett got marks that were higher than the senior angler. So she was better than all the men in the, in the tripos. And this, this was even bigger news than Charlotte Scott. It made the New York Times. It was, there were articles and papers in Australia. Um, she doesn't make a career in mathematics. Um, and uh, she ends up making a career in educational administration. Um, and if you want to know more about her, I've, uh, there's an article on, online you can see in the London Mathematical Society newsletter. But um, the reason I'm also, there are various cartoons of her like this, but this, um, this particular comment I want to draw attention to in the ladies pictorial. And um, what uh, this uh, comment says is that, um, of course, people are going to be really interested in her, but what we want to point out is that in this uh, photograph, uh, this gown, um, that was it was made entirely by her. So it proves conclusively, it's quite possible to unite in one woman, practical domestic virtues and the highest intellectual attainments. So actually it's all right, there can be women who can do maths and they can, um, and they can sew. Um, and again, do we see similar things with, with men? I mean, the, the men who, who do well in the, in the tripos, the fact that uh, they can do carpentry or can they, um, you know, are they crack shots or, or whatever, um, you know, those kind of comparisons are never made. Um, and um, this is uh, a, an even more shocking thing, I think. So this is an article in the girl's own paper written by um, a Cambridge graduate, and he's giving them uh, advice about how to present themselves if they want to have a good chance of, of getting a husband. And, and so he says, the subjects to be avoided, except in an elementary manner, are mathematics, possibly science. Certainly, however, the former. The tendency of mathematics for women is to make them narrow and creatures of only one idea. And then depend upon it, ladies, the judgment of the Cambridge undergraduate represents fairly the judgment of English manhood upon your sex. And if there's anything he hates and ridicules, it's a masculine, unwomanly woman. His ideal of womanhood is a lofty one. He wants to find sympathy in his pursuits, true womanly sympathy, a helpmate, not a lady who understands differential and integral calculus. Um, I think you don't get it plainer than that. Now, I haven't really got time to do my next bit, but I just want to just um, pointed out, um, which is the fact that um, we see these negative images and masculine images of, of, about mathematics appearing in um, a, quite a bit of late 19th, early 20th century literature. And of course, these images uh, persist today. People are still reading um, uh, the, these texts, um, particularly, so for example, the one I will show you is just Virginia Woolf from Night and Day, which was published in 1919, where um, in her, uh, in this particular story, um, one of the, the women in it, Catherine Hilbury, um, is a mathematician. And as Virginia Woolf uh, writes, um, she, she shows Catherine Hilbury being a secret mathematician because she's, um, she rises early in the morning and sits up late at night to work at her mathematics. She's not going to tell anybody that she does it. And then she says, perhaps the unwomanly nature of the science made her instinctively wish to conceal her love of it. But the more profound reason was that in her mind, mathematics were directly opposed to literature. So, um, so I think, you know, it's really important that we know about these passages, that these things are there and that people are still reading them. Now they might, they're not obviously reading them with the view of, of thinking, well, obviously Virginia Woolf's right, but they're kind of, they're, they're actually, they're, taking them in maybe uh, subconsciously and we need to be aware of them and and for my final um, thing that I want to show is um, Hidden Figures I'm sure is familiar to all of you um, fantastic um, film even better book a uh, brilliant book if you haven't read the book I really urge you to write the book but um, what I want to draw attention to is what um, uh, Margulies Shetterly the author of the book writes in the um, at the introduction. And she, she really emphasizes the importance of role models. 
Um, and she says, you know, for her growing up, she knew so many African Americans working in science, maths and engineering, that I thought that's just what black folks did. Um, and I think this is a, another really important point that uh, we really need to, to embrace. And, um, uh, and we can see that uh, we have uh, some amazing role models in uh, Maria Mazzucani and uh, Marina uh, Vyazowska, both who have won the Fields Medal and Karen Ullenbeck, winner of the Arbor Prize. Now it's absolutely terrific that we, we now we have women that we of course have always known that women are, are just as, there's no reason that women aren't just as good at mathematics as men, but we, it's now really been, you know, made uh, explicit with the, these women winning these, the really most kind of prestigious prizes in mathematics. But of course, actually for most people, you know, we are not going to win a Fields Medal um, uh, or Nobel Prize. It's rather like me, I run marathons, I'm not going to win a marathon, I'm certainly not going to get a, uh, um, a world record in a marathon, but that doesn't stop me doing it. It doesn't stop me enjoying it. And I think that's what we need to really um, uh, emphasize here, that actually you can do math, as a woman, you can do mathematics, you can do it anywhere, any, you know, any, there's just, there's no limit um, to who can do mathematics. Um, and I think we really need to um, make this as important as pointing out the, the wonderful work of, of, um, uh, of our medalists, but also the wonderful work that everybody else is doing and they're enjoying doing, and it doesn't make them into um, a nerd sitting in uh, an isolated room, never ever sort of speaking to anybody else, that they do it together, they do it with other people, they might do it on their own, but actually they're having fun doing it and they're achieving. Um, and it's just something that anybody uh, can do if they want to do it. So, um, and I'll stop uh, there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful uh, lecture, as well as the, as the mission statement and the values that you came. I'm glad people don't say anymore that women cannot do mathematics, but we still know that there are obstacles for development of women in mathematics and hopefully we'll overcome all of it with the young people and the next generation. But of course, one of the things that really nice to hear that we all do mathematics because we love it, because we enjoy it, because in some sense <laughs> we can't be without it. So. And that's the message that I want to give also to the young people. If you love it, go for it. Don't think about all the obstacles, just go for it. So this is not a question today. I was just excited, but you say so I, I uh, repeated it. But uh, if are there any questions? I mean, for me, there was a lot of unknown in this uh, speech. So I'm very uh, happy. I used to jump from fourth century, century to 19th century, so there was something before. I mean, in terms of history of women in mathematics, yes. Okay, any, any questions? Any remarks? This uh, lecture is being recorded, and I hope you don't mind that it will be on the website of the IMSA Institute, right? Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> and anyone can also, if anyone wants to email me with any questions that they, um, they sort of think of afterwards or whatever, I'd be delighted to hear from people. I actually have one question because my role model is Emmy Netter. Mm -hmm. And uh, Emmy Netter, she was in Göttingen and then she fled to the USA. And even she fled to the USA, she didn't get the job in Princeton that she was deserving it, of course. Mm. We had before the director of the Institute of Advanced Study in the audience, he's not here, but anyhow, he wasn't the director in 1935. And she had to go to Bryn Mawr, but she was happy because there she got a better position than she had in uh, Göttingen. And okay. she had the uh, weekly or bi-weekly meetings with, uh, with Einstein in, uh, in Princeton. But... Uh, uh, I just wonder why you didn't mention her. Well, I just couldn't mention everybody. So, um, I mean, there are lots of people I didn't mention. And I, I, the thing is with Emmy Nerta, there's so much you can say, and she's perhaps quite well known. And of course, I mean, she had the, the, 
not only being a woman, but of course being Jewish and that's being, you know, having to leave Germany and so on. I mean, there's, um, and actually, if you read some of the, um, her obituaries, again, one needs to read them very carefully because they, um, she is often described as being a great woman mathematician, but amongst women mathematicians, when actually she is a great mathematician. You, you, she is you know. one of the greatest scientists of the it's, 20th exactly, century. Exactly, exactly. But actually, when you read what some of the yeah. uh, the the men mathematicians write about her, it's you, it's actually not what they should be writing yeah. about her. So um, yeah, yeah, I once I once organized a conference on the her heritage in Israel, and the conference was full. I mean, I had a room ready to take all the mathematicians from Israel, but also all the physicists came. Yeah, so yeah. there, there wasn't, she was one of the women great scientists. She was one of the great scientists yes. and mathematician and physicist, physicists mm -hmm. fought who, what she is. Of course, her contribution to physics are yeah. equally yeah. important yeah. as maybe, but yeah, maybe mathematics more. But anyhow, one day we'll talk about <laughs> here about, she became from the, when I identified her as a role model, which was uh, the beginning of uh, late 80s or 90s, and I wanted the, the German government that created the research institute in Israel that I was uh, leading, and I said I want to call it after Eminetter. So the chemist who was vice president of the Max Planck Society asked me who, and I said Eminetter. But in the last 20 years, they're using her name everywhere. So yeah. once I met him again and I say, you remember that you, did, that you didn't know who was Eminetta? He said, of course I remember, but I was hoping that you don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, thank you very thank much you for this uh, talk. I really uh, enjoyed it uh, a lot. And we continued straight because it's on Zoom, so our IT experts can do it immediately. Can, do you want to switch to Michael? Yep. So I move a little bit.